Hello, everyone. Thank you, John, for the introduction. Um, we're going to be talking today about streams, how to build modern data applications with streams, and in particular, Zeo Streams, the library that we've been working on for the last year. We released it at Scaleway Bay last year. <coughs> and uh, we've been developing it and extending it ever since. Now, I've been personally using streams for the last four to five years to build applications, production applications. Um, and I personally believe this is the way you should be building production applications. In fact, if you're not using streams in any sort of capacity in your day-to-day -day work, you're probably missing out. Now, I hope you'll leave this talk as excited as I am about streaming and see how Zeo Streams is a best-of-breed library designed to balance both user ergonomics and not give up on reference and transparency and purity in functional programming. Um, we'll see many examples throughout the talk, and uh, I hope this gives you a taste and excitement to learn more. So, what exactly are data-driven applications? Well, these days, I cannot think of any sort of business that can afford to not be data-driven, where data-driven means that you cannot fulfill business logic or execute business decisions um, without considering multi-dimensional data sets. So for example, let's take um, a case from credit card fraud. Well, credit card fraud, um, to approve transactions, you cannot um, approve them based only on the current geography of the, of the user executing the transaction. You have to consider history, um, past transactions, future transactions, or, or, or trends. And only on those, um, a proper decision can be made whether to approve or not, or to, to determine whether uh, a transaction is fraudulent or not. Or for example, from cybersecurity, um, we all know that firewalls um, are based on simple um, rule sets that are um, statically determining whether a connection can be allowed or not, based solely on the originating IP and a port. Now, of course, these um, rule sets are too weak to, um, to stop um, modern attacks and, and, and modern cybersecurity incidents. You have to go into much more detail, like what is the host that, is, uh, that, is originating, that the connection is originating from? What has, what has it been doing for the last few days? So these sort of data sets are always required these days to make proper decisions and business logic. Now, streams are extremely important in enabling these sort of applications. Um, what sort of tasks do modern data-driven applications are required to go through? Well, first off, we need to plan to ingest large amounts of data, possibly infinite, data that keeps coming in with no stop, and our applications need to be planned to continuously ingest th this data. We need to perform decisions and business, and business logic in near real time based on that incoming data set. And we need to plan to emit new data sets that are then used to continue processing the incoming data. So we're creating a sort of <coughs> business, a, a feedback loop that keeps going on as our applications progress. And finally, um, these days it is hard to get by with a single data store. We need to use the best tool for the job and we need to plan for polyglot persistence which um, in which we use the best tool for each job, for example, Elasticsearch for data indexing, or Postgres for transactional data sets, or um, InfluxDB for time series data sets. Now streams are extremely helpful with these sort of tasks, and we'll see how that is done in a moment. So what <coughs> exactly is a stream, apart from uh, this lovely depiction of the River Thames that I prepared for you. Um, well, the best intuition I know for a stream is actually an iterator. An iterator is a mutable construct that um, 
has a single function called next that emits a new element. We can call that function to pull out an element from the iterator of type A. And there are some uh, interesting properties about iterators that are um, going to be important for streams. Well, first off, an iterator is lazy. Well, it could be strict, but in, 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 per, in, in principle, it is lazy. So once we have an iterator um, of bytes from file here, it has not done anything yet. We need to call next to pull out elements from the stream, from the iterator. Um, another interesting property is that the size of the iterator is indefinite. It could be infinite, or it could be finite. It could be backed by a strict list, or it could be backed by a, a socket. And it might perform I.O. as we call next, which is why an iterator is um, an impure construct. Um, and it might be composed of several transformations from behind. So this iter iterator that we're holding could be, in fact, performing um, a bunch of functions, applying a bunch of functions um, to each element as we pull them out. Now, streams are everywhere. Streams occur in so many different parts of our applications, it is crazy. We, I, I, every one of you has developed an application in which streams could be applied. Kafka topics, or queues in general, could be represented by streams, because if you've worked with Kafka, you know um, a Kafka topic is infinite. As we pull it, more and more data could come in, and it is in, in, in definite size. Database result sets. <coughs> When we execute a, a query against the database, we don't know how many, or we, we can't statically know how many results we're going to get. So a stream is perfect for representing the incoming results from the database. Um, request bodies for HTTP. Uh, there is a type of request called chunk transfer, which may uh, allow a user, a, a client, to upload uh, a, 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 a variable size of, uh, of files to, uh, to, to a server. And of course, files, plain files on disk, they all could be represented by streams. We're going to focus today on functional streams. Now, what is a functional stream? Well, to make something purely functional, we just need to make it total deterministic and pure. And to, um, to represent I.O., our trick is to represent a description of what we're going to do. So a stream, a functional stream, is a description of something from which elements can be pulled. We can pull out elements from, the, from this data type. And pulling an element from the stream is equivalent to evaluating an effect. So every time we pull something out of our functional stream, we're going to be executing a variable number of effects. Now, let's see how Zio streams looks like. We're going to build an intuition for it through Zio itself. So, Zio, R, E, and A, this is a program that requires an environment of type R, may fail with an error of type E, and may yield a single result of type A. So once we evaluate this program, it will yield a single value or fail. So ZStream is, is pretty similar. This stream is pretty similar to that, in that it also requires an environment of type R and may fail with errors of type E. But the interesting difference is that it may yield zero or more results of type A. So as we pull elements out of a stream, we get back a multitude of values, or it could be an empty stream. It could never mean anything. So that's what you need to know about ZStream. It requires an environment of type R, it may fail with multiple errors of type E, and it may yield multiple elements of type A. I'd like to give you now um, a taste of ZStream. We'll see um, a full example, a short one, um, just to see, just to build an intuition for it. So, in this example, we are 
building a Java stream from the files API, which enumerates the files within the data directory. And we are constructing that Java stream inside a Zeo task. <coughs> we are then converting that Java stream to a Z stream. <coughs> All, all conversion methods, all construction methods for ZStream are prefixed with from, so you've got perfect um, auto-completion discoverability. <coughs> we are then mapping each file in parallel, six times in parallel, by creating another stream from the input stream that is uh, created from the path. We grab the chunks, we decode the chunks of bytes to UTF-8 characters, and we split the lines, All right? So that's done using ZSync, which we'll see in a moment. Then we fold that stream by summing the sizes, and we uh, sum the entire sizes of all the uh, files that we've read, and print out the, uh, the, uh, the, su the, uh, the sizes. Okay, so that's ZStream in about 10 lines, I think. This is pretty powerful. I think it'd be um, pretty um, unergonomic to implement without a stream. But let's see what superpowers you all gain just by using streams. Well, <laughs> first off, by using streams, you are forced to implement your computations in an incremental fashion that allows you to translate um, both uh, computations to be performed when you have the entire data set and when you're operating on an infinite data set. So um, let's take, for example, the uh, classic word count uh, problem in which we are, in which we need to uh, count the number of words in the data set. So right here we've got uh, four words with a count and it doesn't matter with streams if we've got the, um, the entire data set in memory or if we're receiving it incrementally. With streams, we can convert this computation to be processed on an infinite data stream or a uh, lazy data stream. And we can construct <coughs> count of words as data comes in. So if the first line comes in, then the second, then the, then the third, we can construct the aggregation incrementally as it comes in. And of course, this is bounded um, by the number of keys, by the number of word, distinct words that we'll see. But you could also, uh, with streams, emit the result sets incrementally in, for example, time windows. We'll see an example of that in a moment. So many, many sort of tasks can be performed incrementally. And streams allow us to um, write our logic in a way that is easily translatable to infinite data sets. Um, another example I like is, um, I call it a wider view. So, say you're writing a file parser, and your interface for that is a function that takes a line and gives you back a task of t, you're parsing the data type of type t. Now, with this sort of function, you're pretty limited if you're only um, parsing a single line every time. So, for example, you can't know whether you're past the headers or not with this sort of interface. You have to keep some sort of mutable state around to, uh, to, to parse things that are context sensitive. With streams, however, with this sort of interface, when you've got the entire stream of lines that you can operate on, you can parse uh, languages that are much more expressive. And this sort of simple example also translates to HTTP servers. So if we're talking about an HTTP server um, handling uh, a request, a single request at a time, um, denies you the option of batching, batching work. So if, you, if you've got a stream of requests, you can apply batching computations to that stream and save some work, whether you're persisting to a database or to a file or performing some computationally expensive work, you can once you've got a wider view of the incoming requests, you can perform much more expressive computations. So these are two short superpowers you gain by using streams. Now, it is often that um, 
non-streaming anti-patterns tend to crop up in our applications. And we should be able to recognize them um, and know when we should be actually using streams instead of manual um, effect, uh, effect, effectful computations. So how many of you have used one of these functions in your applications? Right. So what these functions do is that they take a list of items and effectively map them in parallel. So for example, if we'd like to take a list of numbers and grab all the prime numbers and then do some more hard work on each of these prime numbers, uh, we could do it like this with zero. This will um, process the list 20 items at a time in parallel and grab all the prime numbers, then take all the prime numbers and, and do some more hard work on them. There are two problems with this sort of, uh, this sort of example. First off, you're not getting any pipelining. You need to wait for the entire list to be processed at the first step, sorry, before you, can, before you continue to the next step. So this, uh, this can lead to a pretty severe uh, loss of performance and runtime. And second off, you need to have the entire data set in memory as you, as you process it because um, we, need to be, we need to be processing the entire uh, list of numbers, and this wouldn't have worked if we're talking about an, an infinite data stream. So if this, if this sort of uh, um, numbers collection would have been an infinite stream, this example would have never terminated. So with ZStream, we can um, chop it up pretty nicely like this. Um, we just convert the list of numbers to an iter to a stream. We map it in parallel, 20 <coughs> items at a time, and then we map, we perform the hard work in parallel, 20 items at a time. And this will be pipelined, <coughs> and this easily works for infinite data sets. Right? This is everything you need to do to convert it to Z streams. Now you might say, okay, I could get the pipelining by using fibers and queues. It is extremely tempting to write up ar architectures that look like this. Uh, create a bunch of queues and memory, create a bunch of fibers that copy information from, from between the queues and perform the processing, and it ends up um, kind of like this. Create a bunch of queues, fork off the computations, and we're done. There are a few problems with this. First off, we're not getting interruption right. Well, unless you're using the latest version of Zeo, which you, which, uh, which has the uh, fancy supervision semantics, but you are probably not getting interruption right because if you um, if one of the one of the computations that the main fiber is performing errors out, the other fibers will keep running and you'll be leaking resources. Another thing you're not getting right by using these sort of architectures is graceful shutdown. Many times we'd like to um, wait for the queues to drain before we exit our application. And it's pretty hard to get right in this sort of uh, layout. So fibers, um, fibers are powerful, but they are a very low level concurrency tool. And like um, someone mentioned yesterday, we should be avoiding them like, like the play, manual concurrency. Um, fibers might be uh, more uh, um, efficient than threads, but they are not safe. So instead, what we could do is use ZStream in this fashion. We're generating elements repeatedly, and we've got, we, stuck, we stick a buffer in between each step, and we perform our computations. And this is everything you need to get that pipelining in the same fashion that it looked before. OK. So we've seen a few examples about ZStream, a few examples. Let's do a ground up tour of ZStream combinators and constructors. Um, we'll start out with constructing. We can construct streams um, in a very similar fashion to Scala's standard collection library. So we can use the apply method on ZStream to create a stream in memory that contains a stream. 
and we can convert any sort of iterable collection to a stream. Um, you may notice that I'm using the stream type alias. Um, stream is a type alias for the full zstream data type that um, does not require any environments to, to execute. We can also convert effects to streams. So we can take getterLAN, the function that reads a line from the console, and convert it to a stream that, when executed, will read the line from the console and then emit it through the stream. So we get a single element stream that, as you can see, requires a console to operate and may fail with an IO exception. Uh, we can also um, manage resources using streams. We've got a bracket function that takes an acquisition method. Here we're creating a new input stream and a release function. And for the entire lifetime of the stream, this resource will, be, uh, will, 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 will live. And when the stream ends, and we'll see what, ends, what ending exactly means, when the stream ends, the resource will always be deallocated. So this is the um, streaming version of bracket. Now, once we have, uh, once we have these, uh, these streams, it is usually pretty useful to transform them in many sort of ways. So let's say we're building a web scraper. So we've got a bunch of URLs here that we'd like to scrape. And we can map that um, list that stream of URLs to get back the lengths of each URL. And we can also effectfully map the list of URLs by applying the mapm function, which applies an effectful function, a function that returns a data type of type zero. And we could also um, concatenate uh, the results of scraping the, the URL by using map concat, which Returned, uh, which, which maps the stream with a function that returned an, an iterable. So we can flatten the list of strings that we got by scraping each URL into the stream. Now, we could also concatenate streams by using the plus plus operator in a very similar fashion to uh, the collections library. And we can also flat map streams. If we've got a, a function, scrape URL that returns a string of strings, then we can concatenate two of these streams, or we can um, flat map an existing stream with a scrape URL function to get a stream that flattens all the streams that, are, that have been composed into it. Now, um, it is th these are all functions that you all know from the collections library, except perhaps map, map M. Um, how do we actually generate infinite streams? Well, we've got a few functions for that. So let's say we've got a function that gives us the latest tweet for, for every user. So we've got some hot takes from a user <laughs> named John DeGos. So we can um, repeatedly execute that function to get the latest tweet. And we can um, use the from poll function to, um, to adapt the stream and signal from inside when we should end. So from poll uses a great trick afforded by Zio, by Zio's um, configurable error type, um, we can uh, fail with a none to indicate that the stream has ended. This is a pretty cool trick that we can use with Zstreams. Um, we could also um, get some thought leadership from the user named HMMCopy uh, by repeating the effect with a schedule. So repeating the effect with a schedule means that we will be executing this effect every five minutes. And by using a schedule, you've got the whole API of the schedule, of schedule, sorry, at your, um, at your disposal. So you can construct um, pretty sophisticated streams that repeat um, according to schedules. Now once we've got those hot takes and the thought leadership, we can merge them to a single stream and, for example, convert it to a queue that we can consume from our other parts of our application. So we get back a managed queue that, inside the scope of the managed, um, the stream will be operating and dumping its results into a queue which we can consume from other, other code. We could go back 
to a stream again by converting that managed resource to a stream with stream.manage, which is kind of similar to a bracket. And we can, um, uh, we can create a stream from the queue itself. Now, let's say that we've got an asynchronous function that is based on callbacks, and we're, we'd like to um, register um, some callbacks on that function and get back a stream of the results emitted by those callbacks. So this function is impossible to write without stream because uh, for zero effect async, you cannot, uh, you, cannot use, uh, you cannot use zero effect async with a function that calls its callbacks multiple times. So for that, we've got stream.effect async, which can um, adapt functions that call their callbacks multiple times and emit the results over a stream. So you can get my big data complaints by registering some tweet alerts on using effect async. And you could get back a stream of, uh, of those results. This is a pretty powerful uh, combinator, which I am not aware of in, uh, in other libraries. So it's a pretty cool way of adapting side affecting code to streams. Um, how about some concurrency? Well, we've seen MapMPAR. MapMPAR would let us um, map, effectively map stream in parallel using a configurable uh, parallelism. And we could use flat map par to execute multiple streams in parallel. So for example, let's say we've got a stream of interesting users um, curated by some, some sort of uh, list on, on the net. And we've subscribed to it using a stream. We could um, flat map it by creating uh, nested streams that repeatedly execute that latest tweet function for each user emitted on the outer stream. And the stream we will get um, by using, by using flatmap par will be the merge of all the inner streams that are executed by the function. Now, what this is saying is that we should be executing up to 16 streams in parallel. So once that interesting users list has emitted 17 uh, users, we won't be seeing the 16th user because we're using repeat effect, which is infinite. So what we can do instead is use flat map par switch, which will discard the oldest stream once another user comes in. So we're always watching the latest 16 interesting users as we execute this stream. Um, we could also, of course, chain this with um, a persistence, so we can use mapm4 again. And finally, uh, we would like to aggregate the results of persist tweet. So for that, we could use aggregate async within, that's a mouthful, but what this function does is that it takes a sync, which we will discuss in a minute, which describes how you should fold, how you should aggregate elements, and it takes a schedule, which says when should we finish aggregating elements. And what this will do is that it will give us the sum of bytes written every hour, just by using these two, these four lines, right? aggregate async within. It's a pretty powerful combinator, um, which is even more expressive by the use of sync. So let's talk about aggregations for a while. Um, usually, when we uh, perform streaming computations, we need to perform all sorts of batching, aggregations, merging, smushing of elements. And these are pretty important concerns because um, these are the ways to perform incremental computations on inference streams. So um, for that, we've got Z-Sync. Z-Syncs are first class data types that describe aggregations for these streams. Uh, so how does Z-Sync look? Well, this is Z-Sync. I believe it currently holds the record for type parameters in NZO, maybe only beaten by ZQ. Um, but I, it, it's not very, it's not very in, intuitive, I, I agree. But let's see, uh, let's see how does it actually look. Well, a Z-Sync is a box that may consume multiple elements of type A, it may emit multiple elements of type B, and it may um, spit back 
some of the elements that it has been fed as leftovers of type A0. It, it also, obviously, because it, it can execute effects, it needs an environment of type R, and it may fail with um, errors of type E. So that's the intuition, so the sort of black box that sits on your stream and processes elements and aggregates them or splits them and does whatever you, you'd like it. Um, another, another way to describe it is a stream transducer, if you're familiar with that term. So what are some useful sinks? Well, um, collect all n is a sink that will collect elements fed to it in groups of 10. So you can aggregate your stream with that, apply it to a stream to get back um, a stream grouped into groups of 10. That's pretty useful. Um, we could also fold the elements of the stream by using the fold left sink. All right, so this is a summing sink. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, another pretty useful sink is fold weighted. This sink will allow you to configurably aggregate elements as they come in using a cost function and a maximum cost. So here we are aggregating um, strings into lists based on their lengths up to one kilobytes of elements of, of, of strings in each list. <coughs> so this is a great way to do a sort of a weighted grouping on your stream. So these are all great, and I, I, I guess you could implement them using folds, um, if you were so inclined, without using zsync. But the actual power of zsync and having it as a first class data type is the fact that it is composable. <coughs> so in this example right here, we've got a grouping sync which um, groups elements <coughs> into a map. We're collecting all elements into the map based on their first character. And we, uh, we filter elements coming in um, only if they're not, not, not empty. We only let not empty strings pass. We've got another string called bytes, which will aggregate, um, aggregate strings up to one kilobyte of strings and sum their lengths. And we can, and this is the fun part, we can zip them together to get back uh, a bigger sync that gives us the map from the, from the first sync and the sum from the second sync. And this um, composed sync will, um, will be executing both syncs in parallel and emitting the results once um, either of them is done. And this is the real power of desync, right? Desyncs are very powerful composable aggregations. <coughs> okay, let's see a bigger example. We're going to walk through it. We're going to see how we can, in 10 minutes, create an ETL process, an extract transform load process, that will be rechunking data in S3. So let's say you've got a folder in S3 in which data is coming in, data files are coming in, and you'd like to rechunk those files into files of 16 megabytes each. Um, this is a pretty hefty task, I'd say. Uh, but we'll tackle it in 10 minutes, if that's okay with you. Okay. So what interface do we need? Well, for simplicity purposes, I have uh, created a, a mock interface or a, 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 a mock interface of S3 that returns tasks. You could do that um, pretty succinctly by wrapping over the uh, Amazon S3 client. So we've got delete object, get next batch for a listing, um, get object, list object, put object. These, these are all functions that exist on the actual Amazon S3 client. And we've got um, some data types. We've got a listing of objects in a, in a directory, in S3. We've got the object summary, which is the bucket in which it is located and its key. And we've got the object itself, which contains an input stream that we could, a Java IO mutable, uh, effectful input stream that we could pull to get bytes out from S3. And we are, for the purposes of the presentation, going to use a type alias for, S, for, for our streams um, for a Z stream that requires S3 as its, in, as its environment and may fail with rules and or an limit results of type A. Okay, so to start off, we need to pull some sort of directory in S3. 
We'll do this by using, um, we could do this by using from effect. Uh, we could execute the list objects function and convert the resulting data type to a Z stream using from iter. We get back a list of object summaries and uh, we convert that to a stream. Uh, however, this is not enough because Amazon S3 helpfully truncates results if you've got too many uh, results in, in coming, coming back, which is good because we don't want to blow our memory uh, of the JVM. So we need to keep checking whether the incoming uh, result set is truncated. Now, we can um, paginate over the Amazon listing by using the ZStream paginate constructor. So what this function is going to do is that it will execute um, the, uh, the list results and it will check if it is truncated, the, the listing. If it is truncated, it is going to call um, uh, get next batch from S3 and uh, pass the listing recursively to the next iteration of the function. Now, put together uh, this paginate bucket function with, the, uh, with our full bucket listing is going to look something like this. We'll do a first listing and then we will paginate using it over the result set. So this is all you need to get back the full, the full list of results from S3. The Z stream paginate function. Um, once we've got a stream of, of, uh, of object summaries coming in, we'd like to read each one of them and merge back the lines we've read. So we could do this by um, creating a, a, managed, uh, a managed input stream from every, uh, from every S3 object coming in. So what we're doing here, we're grabbing the object from S3, and we are converting it to a, to a managed input stream. So we're doing this to guarantee the resource deallocation, the closing of the input stream, once we're done with it. And we take that managed and we convert it to a stream, a single element stream that contains our input stream. Now once we've got that, we can convert that input stream to a stream of bytes, grab the chunks, decode them to UTF-8 and split the lines and concatenate the, the lines. All right, so that's a whole bunch of work done in six lines, right? So now we've got a stream of lines from every file in S3. Uh, what do we do with this? Well, we still need to merge everything. So, um, oh, and I forgot, we need to delete the object once we're done. All right, because we, want to, we won't, don't want to read it again on the next poll. So once we are done reading the, the stream, we will um, concatenate the, the file stream with another stream that just executes the effect of deleting the object. So concatenation in streams is like sequencing in effects. OK, so how should our bigger function look like? Well, this is it. We take the full bucket listing, we repeatedly execute it using the poll interval, and we flat map pour each resulting file from that listing to stream the lines out of it. So this is everything you need to merge all the lines from each poll, from all the files. We'll, we will read 16 files in parallel and merge all the files into a single stream of lines emitted by those files. All right. So, lastly, we need to um, batch those lines into 16 megabyte chunks. We will do this using. Uh, oh, sorry. We will do this using fold weighted, that we've seen before. Zsync can help us um, batch those lines into lists of 16 megabytes uh, of data, and. Once we're done um, appending the lines to the list, we will um, reverse the list because we are appending in reverse order. And we will run mkstring to get back a big string concatenate with new lines because we want to chunk up those lines into a single file. So once we've got that, um, we will add an additional constraint that we want to um, uh, 
uh, batch up to 20,048 uh, 20, lines in a single file. So we can use fold until, which will um, run the fold until uh, for, for, an, uh, for a configurable number of times. So here we would like to, we would like count limit to be 20,048. And we can put those two together by using zip par and get back a sync that executes those two, sync, those two syncs. Uh, we don't need the second result because the uh, up to 20,048 20, lines is executing just for, the, uh, just for the effect. So we can use zip par left to get rid of the result. And if you, you're into uh, symbolic operators, you can use this operator <laughs> if, if that's your sort of thing. Okay, now put together with our stream, we just use aggregate async to get our batching sync, and uh, the result there should be a string, not z, not a string, string of unit. And once we've got that stream of um, up to 20,048 20, lines or 16 megabytes, uh, we can use mapm4 to, uh, in parallel, write these chunks back to S3, to a uh, destination board. All right? So put together, I uh, sliced up uh, some of these snippets to make sure they fit. But put together, all of these uh, lines, all these uh, code snippets, are less than 50 lines of code. All right, so that's pretty concise for something that is doing a, a pretty sophisticated task of rechunking data in S3. All right, so I hope this example uh, will convince you to use S3, to use Z streams in your next project. I think it's pretty comprehensible and it's pretty ergonomic and it's pretty performance as well. Um, to end, I would like to uh, give you an intuition of what is a functional stream compared to an iterator, which is a non-functional representation of a stream. So this is our iterator. Um, it has a bunch of problems. Well, first off, it may throw exceptions, right? It, it, it will always return an element of type A, which we know is, is a lie, because errors happen. So um, let's give it the, uh, the ZO treatment and <coughs> Make it configurable in the error type. All right, so now we're saying every time we pull an element from that iterator, it may give us an error of type E or a value of type A. Now, we want to also represent the end of a stream. So what we'll do is add yet another layer called option. So if you get back none, we know the stream is done. Okay, so now we can represent end of stream, and errors, and values. And we can do um, something pretty cool um, by transposing the layers of either an option to move the option to the left-hand side. And now we can represent the same types of data. We can still represent end of stream. We can still represent errors. And we can still represent values. But now we don't need to pay the allocation cost of option on each time we pull an element out of the stream. We just need to pay it when the stream is ending or failing. Um, this is very close to the Z-stream. So we can now um, replace either by IO. So now we can execute effects. And now that we've got an IO value coming out of next, um, we can just make it a, uh, oh, and if we're using IO, might as well make it configurable with the environment type. So we, we, we add the R. And we can get rid of death because it's just a, a value. So it's always going to be the same thing. So now we've got a, a, an interface with one, with one method, so we might as well make it a value. All right, so that's entirely um, equivalent. But this is not enough to represent the stream because um, we need to represent some sort, of, uh, some sort of shared state. Every time we evaluate this next program, we want to get back a different element. So um, if you've seen um, Zio's ref or cat's effect ref, you know that when you are constructing um, mutable, mutable variables, they are always wrapped inside of an effect. So we're going to do the same thing here. Um, to represent our mutable state, we are going to wrap this in another, in another layer of Zio. The other layer can't, can't fail because it's just 
um, mutable state. Um, and this is very close to Zstream. The only difference is that Zstream uses Zmanaged for its R data type. And this is because streams can manage resources on your behalf. As you progress along the stream, they can allocate and deallocate resources. So we're using Zmanaged to represent that layer. Uh, and this is more or less exactly Zstream. Zstream is a case lab that wraps um, a value of this type. All right. Uh, okay, that's it. That's it for my for my for my talk. I before I end, I would like to credit a uh, person who could not be here, Vassil Vassilov, who has helped tremendously with uh, with Zstream and uh, devoted a lot, a lot of his personal time into this project. Um, so big thanks to him. Sadiq couldn't be here, and we've got some time. For